In 1949, a bold and dynamic young preacher set out on a journey that would have an impact on every continent for generations to come. For more than 50 years, and to more than 210 million people, Billy Graham has passionately spoken about the certainty of hope found in Jesus Christ. There are many things about God that I don't understand or comprehend. I accept his revelation of himself by faith. He's brought races and denominations together toward a common purpose as he's preached in 185 countries around the world. Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. He has stood alongside presidents, met with dignitaries and world leaders. And today, Billy Graham is recognized among the most influential religious leaders in the history of the world. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 34. Beginning at verse 34, I want to speak on the subject tonight of Jaws. And I'll tell you why I call it Jaws in just a moment. Here's the words of Jesus, Matthew 12. Old generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof at the judgment. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes, and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see a sign. Show us a sign so that we can believe in you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You're only going to get one sign from me. And that's the sign of Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. During the past few months, we've been listening and hearing and reading all about the Hollywood's blockbuster of the year. It's already been viewed by one out of every four Americans. And it's the account of a killer shark in the waters around Martha's Vineyard in New England who swallows victims and delimbs a lot of victims. And they made a motion picture out of it that's shown all over the world and Time Magazine made a cover story of it. And they could only liken it to Jonah and the whale. They could only find that one literary reference in literature of Jonah and the whale. And so the front pages of our newspapers have carried story after story about how people are afraid to go swimming on the beaches in California and Oregon and Washington and up and down the East Coast this past year or this past summer. And then I read the other day about a man in Australia that lassoed a two-ton shark in Australian waters. Well, I can understand that because I've seen a many a shark in Australia. Cliff Barris and I were out swimming one day in the surf and there came running up to us some men and they said, watch out, the sharks are on the way. There was a shark alert up and we were out swimming right where the sharks were supposed to be. And we had a girl in Australia that played in one of our motion pictures, the shadow of the boomerang. She played the part of a nurse and she was a very wonderful girl and she went out with her fiance and the boat got stuck in the water or in the sand. And she got out to help lift the boat off the sand, and she wasn't in water more than waist deep. And a shark came along and took off a leg. 
and she died before they could get any medical attention to her. And down in Daytona Beach, Florida, they said they had five shark attacks on humans this past year. But this is the year of the big fish stories, both factual and fictional. And it's interesting to me that at the same time this picture has come out frightening people, we have another picture called the Towering Inferno and another one called Earthquake. Besides all the B pictures with all their horror and monster pictures that are coming out to frighten people. No wonder people are biting their fingernails off and taking tranquilizers and afraid to move in their sleep at night. There's never been such an avalanche of horror and fright and some of it very sophisticated to descend upon the human race. And in addition to that, we have to think about the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. And so we're living at a time when people, Jesus said their hearts would fail them for fear. And today, if ever there was a frightened generation from almost every angle, it is today. But that's not what I want to talk about. I like Jonah's story, the story of Jonah and the big fish, better than I do Jaws because Jonah was saved, not destroyed, by a big fish. You say, Billy, do you really believe that this fish swallowed Jonah. Notice I'm calling it a fish because the Bible says a big fish was prepared by the Lord. It doesn't call it a whale. It does in this passage in the New Testament, but in the book of Jonah, it says a big fish. I don't know what kind of fish it was. It could have been a big shark for all I know. Do you say, do you believe that actually happened? Yes, I believe it. Why? Because Jesus said it did. And that's all the proof I need. If Jesus believed it, then I believe it. But I believe that it took an even bigger miracle for this particular fish to be on the very spot where Jonah was thrown overboard and then by some mysterious programming of an internal computer to deposit Jonah precisely on the spot where God wanted him to be. And with all the things that are happening in the biological world today, people have much less difficulty crediting this story than they did 50 years ago. 50 years ago, they'd laugh at Jonah and the big fish, but not today, after we've seen Jaws and some of these other things. And after all the scientific and technological achievements, and every once in a while, you'll pick up a newspaper and you'll find that a man or a crocodile or an alligator or something has been swallowed by a big fish and they found him inside the fish, having never been digested, whatever. Now, the story of Jonah is one of the most thrilling stories in all the Bible. It's only four little chapters. In fact, you could read it in about five minutes, maybe ten minutes. And the scripture says that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah and told him to go and preach judgment to the people of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh had 600,000 population. And Nineveh was a city that was very wicked and very godless and very materialistic. It was a permissive society. Sexual immorality was rampant throughout Nineveh. And God said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. But God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And I want you to warn them that they are going to be judged in 40 days unless they repent. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Every Christian that is here tonight is called to ministry. Yes, you are called. I didn't say you were called to the ministry. I said you were called to ministry. Do you know what the word ministry means? The word ministry means service. Our Lord Jesus Christ came as a servant to serve. And every Christian is called to be a servant, to serve, to serve God, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve his fellow man. Jonah was called of God to go and proclaim the message that God had given him. But secondly, Jonah refused. 
You know, it's tough to do the will of God. You, you say to God tonight, Lord, I'm willing to do your will. I'll do what you want me to do and go where you want me to go and be what you want me to be, and you're going to find tough going. Because you see, to do what God wanted him to do, it was several journeys away over mountains and forests and burning deserts. And Nineveh was the wickedest city in the world, a city of 600,000 people. He would face disease and wild beasts and highway robbers, and then when he got there, the people may stone him to death. And Jonah began to run from God. Jonah couldn't take it. So he decided to flee from the presence of God, and he went down to Joppa, and he got on a boat going to Tarshish, and the scripture says he paid the fare thereof. And I want to tell you something. If you start running from the Lord, the devil will always have a boat there for you. And you'll always have the money to pay the way. And at first, it'll be smooth going. You'll say, boy, I've made the right choice. I know I'm not doing God's will, but I'm doing what I want to do. And I know that I have made the right choice. But after a while, you're going to start running into some rough seas. Then the storms and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the rocks and the reefs are going to come. No man ever turned away from God and found happiness and peace and joy that was permanent and lasting. The psalmist asked, Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? And you know, Jonah thought he had paid the fare. And the captain thought so too. But then the storm came up. And the sailors were frightened. Jonah was asleep. And they said, what's wrong with our ship? Somebody on the ship must have displeased their God. And they began to pray to their gods. Isn't it strange how people began to pray when they're in trouble and maybe they haven't prayed in all their lives? They began to pray. And finally, Jonah told them that he was the one after they'd cast lots and the lot came to Jonah. He confessed that he was running from God. And they said, what will we do with you, Jonah? He said, throw me overboard. They said, no, we'll try something else first. And they began to row and row and row, and they threw everything else over. But the storm got worse and worse, and it looked like the ship was going to be wrecked. So finally, in desperation, they threw Jonah over, and immediately the sea calmed down. And the Bible says that Jonah was caught by a big fish. Now you think of the jaws that fish had. How wide his mouth must have been. But see, that was a specially prepared fish by God to be there at that precise moment. And let me tell you, when you run from God, you're going to be under God's judgment. And Jonah had three days and three nights in the belly of that fish to think. And brother, let me tell you, he was doing some thinking. And he was doing some praying. He was saying, Lord, save me, help me. I don't know where I am. What's happened? And God said, Jonah, I called you into my service and told you what to do, and you've refused me. Now, Jonah, if you're willing to repent of your sin, I'll give you another chance. And Jonah said, yes, Lord, I repent. I'll keep my vow. And the Bible says on the third day, the fish vomited up Jonah. And Jonah found himself on dry land. And the scripture says, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Now, God doesn't give many of us a second chance like that. But he gave Jonah a second chance. And Jonah ran as fast as he could in every way he could straight to Nineveh. And he went up and down the streets of Nineveh crying out, Repent! Turn to God! Judgment's coming in 40 days! Repent, repent, repent! 
Of course, he didn't expect anybody to repent. But do you know what happened? That was the greatest and most successful evangelistic campaign in the history of the world. There's never been anything recorded in history like it. The king, the people, 600,000 of them repented and turned to God and God spared Nineveh. Suppose everybody in Washington suddenly repented and turned to God. And the people of America turned to God as we approach this bicentennial year. What a glorious and thrilling thing it would be. And I want to tell you this, if we did it, God would spare us. But if we don't, this country is in for judgment. Tonight, you as an individual can resist God's call to you and go deeper and deeper in sin. Or you can turn back to God and obey God and do God's will. Which is it going to be? There are many of you young people that have come to Texas Tech University and you have gotten away from God. You need to come back to Him tonight and God will forgive the past and give you another chance and another moment to serve and follow Him. And I'm going to ask you to do that in just a few minutes. Jonah preached the gospel of judgment. But you know, there was an interesting thing about the message that he preached. There was no mercy in it. He didn't offer the people mercy. He didn't tell them that God loved them. But tonight, I have an opportunity to say to you much more than Jonah said to the people of Nineveh. I can say to you tonight that God loves you and God is a merciful God and God will forgive you. But Jonah didn't say that. He just said, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, repent, repent. And the people repented. And that's why Jesus made this astounding statement. He said, the people of Nineveh are going to rise up at the judgment and testify against you. You see, they repented never hearing the gospel of mercy and the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But you've heard the gospel of grace in Christ and you have refused to repent. They'd never heard that Jesus Christ was to die on the cross for their sins. They didn't know that God loved them so much that he was willing to give his son to die on the cross. But in spite of that, they repented. And Jesus said, they are going to be your accusers on the day of judgment. They will testify against you. But then something very interesting happened. Jonah was upset. He didn't want Nineveh to repent. You see, he was obeying God's call to go and proclaim the message, but his heart still wasn't quite right with God because he was afraid that the Ninevites were going to attack his own country, Israel. And he had prophesied that judgment was coming and he didn't like the people of Nineveh. And he wanted to see judgment come. He wanted to be able to say, I told you so. But he didn't know the mercy and the grace and the love of God that would take these wicked, godless Ninevites and forgive them and change them and transform them if they would only turn to him. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is willing to forgive anybody, even you, whatever your sins are, however bad you've been. God says, I love you. I gave my son for you. I forgive you. But Jonah didn't like that, so he went outside the city and got up on top of a hill and looked down over the city, and he had a, a hard, mean scowl on his face as he looked down on the city, waiting for God to burn it up. And the hot wind and the sun came. And he was tired and he was angry. 
And the Bible says that God allowed during the night a gourd to grow up by a miracle and covered Jonah. And the next morning a worm came and cut it off and it fell. And Jonah sat there in the sun and the hot wind blowing on him. And God said, Jonah, you're worried about that gourd. And you love that gourd more than you do those 600,000 people of Nineveh. And that's how the book of Jonah ends. And tonight, many of you are more interested in materialism, your own personal safety. You're interested more in the things that money can buy and the comforts of life and the affluency that we've developed in the United States. You are more interested in that than you are doing the will of God and sharing in the mercy and the grace of God. And let me tell you, you're going to have to make a choice. Jesus said there are two roads of life, the broad road and the narrow road. There are two destinies, heaven and hell. There are two ways to live, two masters, materialism and God. Which is your master? Which road are you on? And God has put a little computer down inside of you. You've got a computer system down there. It's your will. And you have the ability to choose whether you're going to serve Christ and whether you're going to serve God and his kingdom and put yourself in the will of God and say, oh Lord, I'll march in your army. I'll march under your flag. I'll go out with love in my hearts to try to help change the world. I'll go out and do your will no matter what it costs, whether it's a burning desert or a steaming jungle. I'll go out even if it means I have to break up with my boyfriend who doesn't live for God. I will go out, O oh Lord, and serve you no matter what the cost. And Jesus said, count the cost. If you're not willing to pay the price, then quit it. Don't even fool with it. It's costly to follow Christ. But I want to tell you the rewards are absolutely unbelievable. The reward of joy and peace and security, knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that you're going to heaven, knowing that you're in the will of God, whatever comes and whatever goes. I'm going to ask hundreds of you tonight to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say tonight, I want Jesus Christ into my heart. I want him not only as Savior, but I want him as Lord. I want to put myself in his hands. I want his forgiveness. I want his transforming power. And I'm willing to serve him if he should call me. And I'm going to ask older people and younger people, you need Christ, whoever you are, I'm going to ask you to come and stand. And after you've all come and stood, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature. Then you can go back and join your friends. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus or a delegation from a distant city, they'll wait. It'll only take a couple of three minutes for you to come, perhaps more from the upper stands. But get up and come now. Bring your friend with you. Whole families can come together. You need Christ tonight. You want Christ to be yours, and you're ready to pay the price, whatever it costs, to serve and follow Christ. You get up and come quickly from all over this stadium. We're going to wait on you right now. Men, women, young people. You say, well, Billy, why do you ask us to come? Every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. It's very important that you come publicly and openly and declare yourself for Christ. Many people are already on the way. You come and join them right now. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just to go tell me he accepted Christ at a bar watching one of these telecasts, and it changed his life. That could happen to you.
If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. Tonight, I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament, to Joshua, the 24th chapter. Joshua, as you know, was a great military leader. And he took the place of Moses when Moses went to be with the Lord. And the 15th verse. Now, he had called all the leaders of Israel together at a place called Shechem. And he's getting ready to die, and this is his farewell address. And during this address, he warns the people about their idolatry. He warns them that the judgments of God will fall upon them unless they live for the Lord. And here's what he says. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. If you want to serve the devil, serve him. But make a choice. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, if every one of you serves other idols and other gods, makes no difference. As for me and my house, we've already made a decision we are going to serve the Lord. And that's a decision that every single person here tonight has to make. You either have to decide that you're going to serve the gods of materialism all around us, or the true and the living God. And Joshua was warning the people to choose God, to follow him instead of these other gods. And so, we have to make a choice. Moses had warned Israel much earlier, a generation earlier, when he was dying. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Moses had said the same thing that Joshua is saying, separated by many years, and every generation has to hear it over and over and over again. And that's why the gospel never grows old. It applies to every generation alike. We have to make a choice. Alexander the Great was asked how he conquered the world. He said, by not wavering. And James says in the first chapter, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He said, a double-minded man 
is unstable in all his ways. Are you unstable about your relationship to Christ? Do you waver in your relationship to Christ? Or are you totally committed to Christ as Savior and Lord? Or do you waver about it? Many of you waver by the way you live. And Jesus warned the hypocrites, people who pretend one thing and live another. This was his great battle with the hypocrites in the church. We have old proverbs that are familiar to us all. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Don't waver. Make a decision. Do it now. That's what Joshua was saying. And Joshua, the great military hero that had led them from victory to victory, reminded them of all the victories that God had given. And he said, serve God and live. Serve these other gods and you'll die and come under the judgment of God. And the message has not changed. Now the wars were over. But Joshua found that the people were going toward idolatry. And many times the problems of peace are greater than the problems of war. And he had called all these leaders to Shechem. Now Shechem was a place, the most historical place in all of Israel at that time. And still is today. It was where Abraham had first settled when he left Ur of the Chaldees. It was where Jacob had purchased his parcel of land. It was where the bones of Joseph had been buried when they were brought up from Egypt. And so he has, there are two mountains there. I've stood there. And on one mountain he put six of the tribes and on the other mountain he put the other six. And Joshua spoke with a mighty voice even though he was an old man. And he reviews the history of Israel and how God had blessed them. And how they had won their victories, not by their own power and their own strategies and their own ingenuity and their own strength, but by the power of God. And the people should have been grateful to God, but instead they were now going to other gods. And we in America should be grateful to God for the blessings he's given us. But what do we find? We find that we're worshiping other gods, the gods of pleasure, the gods of lust and greed and hate, the gods of materialism, even the gods of war. And Joshua tells them that such a condition cannot continue. They must decide whether they want to serve the idols or to serve the living God. And he will not allow any neutrality. Neither does Jesus Christ. And Joshua said, you have to decide immediately now. Choose you this day, not tomorrow, this day, whom you're going to serve. And many of you are going to have to decide tonight. What is the number one priority in your life? Is the priority Christ? Or is the priority something else? Christ demands first place. There's no room on the throne of your heart for two gods. It's either Christ or it's the other God. Because I believe the emphasis must, we must lay it out straight that you cannot serve God and mammon. You must make a choice. And I found that the harder the challenge is, the greater the response. Young people today want a challenge. They want something tough and hard, all right? Give your life to Christ. He'll challenge you because he says you must deny self and take up a cross. He says, I'm going to a place of execution. Come and go with me. Deny your own selfish ambitions and lust and turn to me and go to the cross with me. Now, Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. There's a film showing throughout the world this year called The Idol Maker, but a Christian is an idol breaker. And regardless of their decision, Joshua said, it's for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. You know, Adam and Eve had to make a choice in the Garden of Eden. God said, if you want to build a wonderful world, we'll build it together. But I'm going to test you because I've given to you the ability to choose. 
I haven't made you a robot in which I could punch a button and you would obey me. I've made you in my image. You have the right to choose. So when Adam and Eve faced that choice, they chose wrongly. They broke the law of God. And God said, in the day that you do, you will suffer and die. And man has been suffering ever since. And it's all because of that first sin in the Garden of Eden. And man has been inheriting that tendency to sin ever since. The seed of sin is in us when we're born. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Think of it now. At conception, sin was already planted. And then comes the age of accountability, moral accountability, maybe eight or nine or ten years of age, when you are held accountable by God for your actions and you choose to sin. And then the rest of your life you practice sin. You're born towards sin. You choose to sin at a certain point, And then you practice sin. And the Bible says we have all sinned. And we're all idolaters. Now, Adam had to make a choice, and he made the wrong choice. You have to make a choice. Many of you that are watching by television, I hope that you'll use that telephone number right now and call in and make the choice for Christ and say to that counselor, as for me in my house, I choose the Lord. And then many choices, like the rich young ruler. Remember, he came to Jesus, and he was filled with questions and he wanted eternal life and he said sir what must I do to find eternal life and Jesus said looked at him and loved him and said go sell all that you have give it to the poor take up the cross follow me the young man was grieved he wept he wanted Christ but he wanted his money more. Now, if he had said, all right, I'll do it, Lord, I'm sure the Lord would have said, no, it's not your money I want. I want your heart. It's our attitude toward these idols and toward the, these things. The television itself can become an idol. When we walk into the room, all conversation stops and we sort of sit there in reverence watching that box to see if J.R. is going to be shot again. Now, the Bible says we must choose two ways of life. Jeremiah had written, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There's a way of life, there's a way of death. Which way are you on? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I'm the only way. I'm the only way to permanent peace. I'm the only way to permanent joy. I'm the only way to eternal life. I'm the only way to forgiveness of sin. I'm the only way to the Father. You have to come by me. And that eliminates a lot of people. When Jesus began to talk about dying on the cross, a lot of his followers left him. They said, Lord, we thought you were going to sit up on a big throne and we were going to drive in Cadillacs and we were going to have beautiful swimming pools and lovely ladies and all the rest of it. We didn't really know that you were going to die and wanted us to go with you. We thought this was going to be a kingdom and we were going to overthrow Rome and we were going to rule the world. And that is going to happen someday. But not now. The cross before the crown. Some of us want the crown before the cross. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. What are some of the ways? Well, some people say, I'm going to follow my conscience, but you don't follow your conscience. Many of us have dead consciences. Your conscience is no longer a safe guide. You've hardened it, you've deadened it. And then other people say, well, I try to be sincere in everything I do. We're, we're here on a football stadium right here. And many years ago, I saw a man pick up a football and he ran 65 yards the wrong way. Now, he was one of the most sincere fellows you ever saw. <laughs> Lost the game. 
And then there are many people that say, well, you know, I do a lot of good works and I give money to charitable causes and I, I do all that. I, I'm sure God will understand. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, not, not that not of yourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you could work your way to heaven and pay your way to heaven, you'd get up and say, look what I did. I got myself here by my own good works. The only way you're ever going to make it is to come to that cross where Christ took our sins and our judgment and our hell and identify ourselves with him. And then there are some people that say, well, I'll reform, I'll do better. I know people that are always saying I'm going to do better, but they never do better. They don't have any power within them to do better until they come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, an explosion takes place of power that he gives you to live a new life. I can't live the Christian life. I have no power within me to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit has to live in me and Christ has to live through me. I cannot live the Christian life. I'm a total flop and failure. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Few, he said, only a few are going to find that narrow gate and that narrow way, as I said last evening. Are you among that few? You not only choose between two ways of life, but you choose between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism, he says in Matthew the sixth chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. You have to make a choice. All the way through the Bible, choices, 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 choices. Not only between two ways of life and two masters, but you're going to have to choose between two fathers. Two spiritual fathers. He said in John 8, a very shocking statement. The 44th verse. He said, you are of your father, the devil and the lust of your father you will do. Now, he says, for many of you, the devil is your spiritual father. Now, you're not aware of it. You wouldn't admit it, but that's the way God looks at it. There's either God, your spiritual father, the true and the living God, Christ, or there's the devil. And then you have to choose not only between two ways of life and two masters and two fathers, but you have to choose between two destinies, heaven or hell. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7, 27. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, he taught at both universities, used to emphasize, he said, no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with more clarity and authority as Jesus Christ. And one of the most played pop songs is the Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. He is the way to heaven. Come to him. And if you want to come to him, pick up that telephone if you're watching and call that counselor who's waiting to talk to you about the way to heaven and how you can find Christ. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes, Jesus is in heaven preparing your estate right now. Waiting for you. There is a future life. And eternal life does not begin when you die and go to heaven. It begins here and now when you make this choice for Christ. Because eternity, eternal life comes to dwell in your heart tonight. Jesus Christ is the gateway to heaven. Now this choice also, you must make yourself. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Your father can't make it for you. Your mother can't make it for you. Your children can't make it for you. This is where you must choose yourself. 
He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within ourselves where we retire from all other fellowships, comradeships, and influences. And there's a lonely arena where the greatest battles of life must be fought alone. And this is a decision that you have to make alone. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that thou and thy seed may live forever. Notice it says thy seed. This has something to do with your children and your grandchildren and your children's children. My son and I were talking tonight about how it passes on from generation to generation. This faith that we have in Christ. The writer to Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a choice. Moses could have probably been the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, heir to all the riches and power of Egypt. And he made a choice to suffer persecution and the reproach with the people of God. He didn't know that his name would be in history. He didn't know that someday he would lead all of Israel. He didn't know that someday he would be considered one of the greatest men that ever lived. When he made that choice, he made it on the basis of simple faith in God. Some think that Guy Lafla is the world's greatest hockey player. And he said a month ago that each of us has only one past but there are many futures. You see, you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. And when you do that, Christ changes your past. He wipes out all the sins of the past. Because you see, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses it from all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. When he died on that cross, he forgave all the past. You tonight are reminded of the many sins in your life. The Holy Spirit's bring them to your mind right now. And you know they stand against you at the judgment where every secret thing will be brought out. But Jesus tonight offers forgiveness. But he offers more than forgiveness. He offers justification, just as though you had never committed a sin. What a wonderful thing to go to bed tonight and know that the past is gone, forgiven, cleansed, and God no longer remembers your sins. Yes, and this choice is very urgent. To delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision is itself a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. Choose now. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise a tomorrow. Come while you can. Time itself makes the decision for you if you don't. You say, but what do I have to do? Three things. You must be willing to repent of your sin. That means to change your way of thinking about your sins and realize how bad they are in the sight of God. Change your way you're thinking about God and say, I love him and I'm going to love him with all my heart, mind, and soul. I'm going to make him the priority of my life. I'm going to put him first from now on. He's going to be not only my savior, but my Lord. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. You may be an officer in the church, but you're not sure about your relationship with Christ and you want to be sure. And you must be willing to repent. And secondly, by faith, receive Christ into your heart. That means you put your whole weight on him and trust him and him alone. And thirdly, you follow and serve him as his disciple and follow him and obey him. That means a big change for many of you if you make this choice. I'm going to ask you to make it now. And the reason I do it publicly is because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. Joshua called upon the people publicly. Moses called upon the people publicly to inscribe their commitment that would be seen publicly for generations to come. 
I'm asking you tonight to publicly and openly come and say tonight, Christ is going to be priority in my life. I want to know that I have eternal life.